Thank you for joining our presentation today on the November 2022 California ballot propositions. I'm Elaine Manley, the co-president of the League of Women Voters of Cupertino and Sunnyvale. There'll be three of us presenting today. So now I'll turn it over to Nancy. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Nancy Smith, and I am the program director at the League of Women Voters Cupertino Sunnyvale. Now I'll introduce Tracy Edwards. Hi, my name is Tracy Edwards, and I am co-president along with Elaine of the League of Women Voters of Cupertino Sunnyvale. Now, before we get to the purpose of this forum, and forum, which is to discuss the ballot proposition, here's some background about who the League is and about voting in the November election. The League has been empowering voters and defending democracy for over 100 years. We were founded in February of 1920, just six months before women won the right to vote through the passage of the 19th Amendment. We do have two distinct functions done separately through two different corporations, one that does voter education, of which today's event is an example, and the other, which after extensive study, takes positions and then as appropriate, advocates for the passage of laws. Next slide, please. Regarding the November election, when you get your ballot, please pay attention to how they list your name. Is it first and last or first, middle and last? Sign your name in the same way it's shown on the envelope. It needs to match the way you signed when you registered to vote or when you signed your driver's license. Now, because California has passed the Voters' Choice Act, you have several options on how to vote and how to deliver your ballot. You may de deliver your ballot by mail, but if you do so, please mail early or you can place your ballot in a drop box or deliver your ballot to a vote center. These centers replace the community polling stations. Next slide, please. You may be asking yourself, well, how do I find a vote center or a drop box? And got good news here. It's very simple. You go to the URL shown or capture the QR code, go to the site, enter your address and your drop off locations and vote centers will be listed. Next slide. And we always recommend that you check your voter registration status, also very easy to do. Use the URL or the QR code, go to the site, enter your name, your California driver's license or your California ID card, the last four digits of your social security number and your birthday. And if you get a retry, you should probably register again. Next slide, please. Now to say that California ballot can be challenging is an understatement. And we also have some good news here. And that's Voters Edge California, which is a joint project of MapLite and the League of Women Voters. Voters Edge California is a comprehensive nonpartisan online guide to elections covering federal, state and local races in the state of California and state and local ballot measures. And it also includes very important information on campaign finance. My, personally, this is my go-to research, my go-to resource when I complete my ballot. Now, what we're doing today is a pro-con. What is that? Well, the League of Women Voters produces an analysis of propositions on the ballot. This provides an unbiased, nonpartisan information on ballot measures in clear, easy to understand language. And for each proposition, we outline the issues, provide the context for the proposition, review the arguments for and against. And the goal here is to provide you information to make an informed decision. So let's get started with Prop 1. Proposition 1 is a legislative constitutional amendment and requires a majority vote to pass. Legislative constitutional amendment means it was placed on the ballot by the Assembly and the State Senate. Next slide. Prop 1 asks the following question. Should the California Constitution expressly provide that the state of California shall not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom, including the right to choose to have an abortion and the right to choose or refu refuse contraception? Next slide, please. So how did we get here? Well, in 1973, building on several preceding cases, the Supreme Court answered yes to the following question. Does the Constitution recognize a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy by abortion? And they found that inherent in the Constitution was the fundamental right of privacy, and that right protects a preg pregnant woman's choice as to whether to have an abortion. Now, this year, in Dobbs v. Jackson, which overturned Roe v. Wade, 
the Supreme Court ruled that the rights that are not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution must be deeply rooted in history and tradition in order to be guaranteed. And they found that the right to abortion was not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution and that there was no deeply rooted history and tradition guaranteeing abortion. And thus they overruled Roe v. Wade. Next slide. Now shifting to California law, the California Constitution, unlike the federal Constitution, does expressly recognize the right to privacy, but it does not mention the right to an abortion. That said, California law, not the Constitution, does recognize reproductive rights, including the right to abortion. However, in light of the Dobbs decisions, concerns have been expressed as to whether a future California court might overturn the law and eliminate reproductive choice. So Proposition 1 seeks to further protect the right of privacy with respect to reproductive decisions by expressly adding the right to an abortion to the Constitution. Next slide. So Prop 1 proposes to change the California Constitution to say the state cannot deny or interfere with a person's reproductive freedom and that people have a fundamental right to choose whether or not to have an abortion and whether or not to use contraception. And one last point, there is no direct fiscal effect from Proposition 1. Now, i just pause on this next slide and let you read the list of supporters and opponents to Proposition 1. Next slide, please. So what do the supporters say? Those supporting Prop 1 say that California can no longer count on the federal government to protect its rights. So it's important to enshrine the fundamental right to an abortion and contraception in the California state constitution as an extra protection. The law would ensure that only future state voters, not politicians or justices, could alter those rights. And healthcare providers say that it's necessary to keep reproductive medical decisions where they belong with individuals and their healthcare providers based on scientific facts and not on political arguments. Next slide. Those opposing Prop 1 say women already have the right to choose under California law. The recent US Supreme Court ruling did not and will not change this. Prop 1 is not needed to protect women's health or reproductive rights. And further, that the Prop 1 is an extreme and costly proposal that allows unrestricted late-term abortions and punishes taxpayers. Abortion seekers from outside California will swamp California resources. I'm going to also pause on this slide and let you read the list of those funding the passage uh, of Proposition 1, both in opposition and in support. And you'll see that 14.4 million has been raised in support of the proposition and 161,000 has raised, been raised in opposition to the proposition. Next slide, please. So what does your vote mean? Well, a yes vote means that the California constitution would be changed to expressly include existing rights to reproductive freedom, such as the right to choose whether or not to have an abortion or use contraception. A no vote means the California Constitution would not be changed to expressly include rights to reproductive freedom. But these rights, however, would continue to exist under state law. Elaine, do we have any questions? We do not have any questions at this time. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A and we will do our best to answer each proposition's questions as we go along. So I'll give it a moment. While we're waiting, Tracy, is there something that you think that people would want to know? Um, I think, you know, Elaine, there, there are two things that came up predominantly around Proposition 1. One had to do with the viability provision uh, or, or the debate around, is there a viability provision uh, within Prop 1? And it might be worth touching base on that. California law does allow a woman to have abor an abortion. This is under law, not the Constitution. 
um, until the point that a, a physician determines that there's a reasonable likelihood that the fetus's sustained survival outside the uterus can occur without extraordinary medical interventions. And it would, an abortion can be provided after that uh, if it's necessary to protect the life or health of a woman. But the exact point of viability is not defined in law. The opponents to Prop 1 uh, say that the overly broad language in Proposition 1, which does not mention, again, as I said, viability restrictions, would override state law and allow abo abortions into the third trimester. And supporters and legal experts have said that's not the case, that the ballot measure would work in tandem with existing state law so that the um, defined viability measure, a, a decision made by the physician would uh, stay in fact in place and this proposition would not alter it. If we have more time, I could touch on one other point if you'd like. Uh, two things, we do have a question from the audience. So let's take that first and then we can go to the other point that you uh, had in mind. So the question is, how is the taxpayer affected? Who pays for abortions if the person can't pay? Yeah, so the point we made in the presentation is um, California has an organ has, has a governmental unit that assesses uh, fiscal impacts of propositions, and they have determined that there's no fiscal impact from this proposition. And that's because uh, the, the payment for abortion already exists in California law. So today, you pay for it either through the medical insurance premiums or you're covered through um, uh, Medi-Cal or Medicaid, and you get your coverage that way. And if an abortion is needed, it is covered under your existing uh, insurance. So the reason California, the state of California determined there's no fiscal impact is that there is no change to California law and there is no viability adjustment under California law. So abortions are paid for now and they would be paid for in the same way after the proposition. Very good. There's no more listed questions, but I know we had received a question from a, an earlier presentation, and I think it's a, a very important point. So why don't you share that one, if you would, please? And in, in, in this one, you're asking about uh, if there's a federal legislation ban on abortion. Right. Yeah. So the, the, the question that we were previously asked is what happens if Prop 1 passes and there is federal, federal legislation that is implemented, uh, that implements a national ban on abortion. And the, and the short answers, and a very unsatisfactory answer is we don't know. And if it happens, it will undoubtedly be litigated. And the longer answer is that there are many opinions, but there's two prominent ones uh, that are currently in circulation. One says that a federal ban on abortion could supersede Proposition 1 but this would depend on the Supreme Court finding that the US Constitution grants fetal rights before viability outside the womb. And if it found that, then it would bar California from using any competing individual interest, whether in the Constitution or in California law, to grant abortion rights. Now, on the other side, others would say, no, a federal ban on abortion would not be legal for the following reasons that while there's, and this takes a little bit of a tour through the US Constitution. Yes, there's something called the Supremacy Clause, which says when US uh, law is, it, or US Constitution is in conflict with state law or constitution, federal wins, and that's the Supremacy Clause. But then the 10th Amendment put a governor on that right. And it said that the Supremacy Clause only comes into play when there are powers that are enumerated and delegated to the federal government. Otherwise, the rights are reserved for the states. And this is, if you think back to your high school governance classes, this is states' rights. And there is one other element that we have to consider, and that is the 14th Amendment. And it says that Congress can intervene to stop a state from violating constitutionally guaranteed rights. So we have those three constitutional provisions, but then we have the Dobbs decision. And the Dobbs decision declared unequivocally that there is no constitutional right to abortion. So if the court denies there's a constitutional right to abortion, Congress can't create that right and then compel the states to enforce it. So those are the two sides. One saying, yes, if the Supreme Court finds there's a right 
for an unborn uh, unborn child has rights in the Constitution, they could put a, they could make the ban legal. The other says no. Dobbs and the preceding constitutional law and how it has played out would prohibit it. Very good. We do not have any additional questions. So I believe I'm going to hand this off to Nancy. Yes. Thank you, Tracy. I will be talking about Prop 26. Uh, Prop 26 allows in-person roulette, dice games, sports wagering on tribal lands. The question for Prop 26 is, should California increase the allowable gambling activities on American Indian owned casinos and allow betting on sports events at casinos and horse racing tracks? Currently, tribal casinos in California can offer poker, bingo, and other games. Uh, sports betting, roulette, and dice games are not allowed in American Indian casinos or anywhere in California. The rules governing American Indian-owned casinos are set by individual agreements called um, compacts between the owner tribes and the state of California. Prop 26 would allow tribal casinos to run roulette and dice games such as craps. It would also allow tribal casinos and four horse tracks in California to offer on-site betting on sports events to those 21 years old or older. No betting would be allowed on high school sports or on California college sports. Prop 26 would allow people or entities to file civil lawsuits if they believe someone is breaking state gambling laws. The fiscal impact will depend on the terms of the agreements between the casinos and the state and on how much people who play or bet on sports will spend. There will be a 10% tax on sports betting of which 20, uh, sorry, 70% will be sent to the general fund, 15% for programs dealing with gaming and mental health research, and 15% to the Department of Justice for enforcing gaming laws. Um, Prop 26 could increase state revenues by, mm, from taxes paid by racetracks and from civil penalties for violations of the law potentially reaching tens of millions of dollars each year. Those will also be increased, there, there will be increased costs to enforce and regulate the new betting, which could reach the low tens of millions of dollars each year. Those uh, who support Prop 26 include over 20 American Indian tribes, the Deputy Sheriff's Association of San Diego County, California Young Democrats and others, and those opposed include Bicycle Casino, Hollywood Park Casino, the California Republican Party and others. Supporters of Prop 26 say that it would continue a 20 year legacy of allowing closely regulated gaming to support American Indian economies. It would allow California's tribes to provide vital services like healthcare, housing, infrastructure and education to tribal members. By raising state revenue, Prop 26 benefits all of California and will increase jobs and opportunity for Indian tribes and all Californians. The opponents say that Prop 26 would massively expand game gambling in California for the benefit of only a few large tribal casino, casinos and smaller casino owners are worried that tribes will sue them for infractions, putting their operations out of business. Gambling is addictive and legalizing more kinds of gambling is bad for public health and safety. The main financial supporters of Prop 26 at the time of this writing are five large Indian tribes as listed on the slide and the total amount donated in favor of Prop 26 as of yesterday is $118 million. The financial support for the opposition has come from several casinos as listed on the slide. The total amount donated against the proposition has been $42.5 million. The bottom line is that a yes vote on Prop 26 means that tribal casinos could offer roulette, dice games, and in-person sports betting. Four racetracks could offer in-person sports betting, and people and entities 
would be able to file civil lawsuits to enforce certain game, uh, state gambling laws. A no vote means that sports betting would continue to be illegal in California. Tribal casinos would continue to be unable to offer roulette and games uh, played with dice, and no changes would be made to the way state gambling laws are enforced. Thanks for your attention on Prop 26 and uh, wondering if anybody has any questions. We, we have no questions at this time for Prop 26. Okay, uh, let's move on to a related gambling proposition, which is Prop 27 which would allow online and mobile sports wagering outside tribal lands. The question for Prop 27 is, should California allow online and mobile sports betting for persons 21 years of age or older? The California Constitution and the California statutes define what kinds of gambling are allowed in the state. Currently, it is legal to play the California lottery, bet on a horse race, put wagers down in card games and in certain card rooms, and gamble at American Indian-owned casinos. These casinos are allowed to operate slot machines, lottery games, and certain kinds of card games. The rules governing American Indian-owned casinos, as mentioned earlier, are set by compacts between the owner tribes in the state. At present, betting on sports events is not legal in California. The US Supreme Court, however, ended the federal prohibition on sports betting in 2018, opening the door for states to legalize the practice. About 30 states have taken that step so far. Since the California legislature has failed to come up with legislation addressing sports betting, initiatives are being placed on the ballot to help craft what would be legal in California. If passed, Prop 27 would legalize mobilize, uh, mobile sports betting and dedicate some of the revenue to the California Solutions to Homelessness and Mental Health Support Account and the Tribal Economic Development Account. Licensed tribes or gambling companies who meet certain monetary criteria could offer online sports betting over the internet and mobile devices to persons 21 years of age and older on nine tribal lands in California. Online sports betting entities would be required to pay the state a share of their sports betting profit. A new state unit would be created to regulate the online sports betting and new ways to reduce legal, illegal online sports betting would be available. Both Prop 26 and 27 legalize sports betting in some way. And if both pass, it's possible that both would take effect. If a court finds that part of the propositions are in conflict, the one that received the most yes votes will become law. The fiscal impact on the state and local budget if Prop 27 passes depends on a number of variables, such as the number of entities that offer online betting, the possible renegotiation of compacts between the state and tribes that offer online betting, and the number of people who engage in online betting. There is a potential for increase in the state revenue reaching from the hundreds of millions up to 500 million each year. Some or all of the regulatory, regulatory costs would be offset by payments sports betting of operators must pay to the state for regulation. So who are the supporters and those who oppose Prop 27? The supporters of Prop 27 are Californians for Solutions to Homelessness and Mental Health Support, a um, political action committee that is leading the campaign. Supporters include the mayors of Fresno, Long Beach, uh, Oakland, and Sacramento, and three major bands of American Indi Indian tribes, as well as Major League Baseball. The leaders of the opposition to Prop 27 are the Coalition for Safe Responsible Gaming. Opponents also include both the Democratic and Republican parties of California 
and the Democratic and Republican heads of each branch of the state legislature, and over 50 Indian tribes and the California Teachers Association and the Communication Workers of America also oppose the proposition. Those supporting Prop 27 say that it would provide hundreds of millions of dollars to support programs that alleviate homelessness, mental health, and addiction in California. Online betting is currently happening in California through offshore operators and bookies, and many feel that gambling should be legal in California as it is in other states. For those who oppose Prop 27, they say that it's being pushed by the out-of-state online gambling industry and will generate billions of dollars for their companies, most of which will leave the state. It costs a sporting, a sporting entity $10 million to become an online uh, betting organization, making it almost impossible for smaller gaming companies to compete. Also, opponents feel that since a person could make a bet from any mobile device, it will make gambling much easier and add gambling addiction problems, which is a major cause of bankruptcy and results in homelessness. Finally, legalizing online gambling is not a solution to homelessness or other social ills. Uh, for the uh, campaign finance, uh, as of yesterday, the supporters had raised over $169 million in favor. The main contributors are the FanDuel Sportsbook, DraftKings, BetMGM, Penn Interactive, and FBG Enterprises. Opponents have raised over $235 million. The main contributors are, the, are five of the major American Indian tribes each of which has contributed over $10 million. So the bottom line for Prop 27 is that a yes vote means licensed tribes or gambling companies could offer online sports betting over the internet and mobile devices to persons 21 years of age and older on non-tribal lands in California. It would increase, uh, it would create a new state unit to regulate this type of betting and new ways to reduce illegal online sports betting. A no vote means that sports betting would continue to be illegal in California and there would be no change. That's it uh, for this one. Does anybody have any questions on Prop 27? We had one question come in. Um, let me see if we can handle this one. Nancy, what has the impact of legalization been for the 30 states you mentioned or the 30 government units you mentioned that had passed it? Um, I would, I've looked into Illinois a little bit and it has increased the, the funding for the state. Um, so I think states are looking to Illinois and, uh, other, other states that have legalized it. Um, I think some of the other impacts, uh, are a little, you know, still being decided, but, um, but it has been increasing the funding. So the, the, uh, the, the, the opponents have said that it increases the adverse effects are it, it 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 creates bankruptcies it drains family resources has illinois experienced that i haven't looked into that uh so much maybe we could do a little um sleuthing and report back before we close the meeting okay and Another question came in about how much money would really go to fund homelessness from this proposition? Um, I think looking at the, I don't think it will be uh, hundreds of millions of dollars because of the cost of the, um, of the policing aspects. So I think a lot of funds will actually go toward um, managing um, and reducing illegal betting. So I, I haven't heard. I don't know. I can also look that up. Very good. So we'll work on that while you're off screen. Yep. And that those are the two questions that have come in. OK. Great. Well, that closes our conversation for the moment for the gambling. And we'll move now to Prop 28, uh, which um, would provide additional funding for arts and music education in public schools.
The question that Prop 28 asks is, should the state provide specific funding for arts and music education in public schools uh, and an amount higher than the existing constitutional minimum amount required for public education? California has about 6 million students in kindergarten through 12th grade. And around 60% of these students are from low income households. The state constitution explicitly states that education of children is a budget priority and was amended in 1998. That year, Prop 98 passed. It required a minimum percentage of the state budget to be spent on education, specifically kindergarten through two-year community college. However, there's currently no guaranteed source of annual funding in the state budget for arts and music education in K through 12 public schools. Even with no guaranteed source of funding, schools must fulfill state law requirements for art and music education. For example, schools are required to provide arts and music instruction to all students in grades one through six. Also, another example is that in order to graduate, high school students must complete a year in one of three courses of study, one of which is arts and music education. Prop 28 would require an additional portion of the state's general fund to be set aside to pay for arts and music education in K through 12 public schools. Most state school funding is distributed through a per student formula, which gives schools more funding based on the share that they have um, of their students who are low income English learners or in foster care. Uh, to, to address equity issues, schools that serve many low income students would be allocated more funding under this measure. It would require schools to report on how the funds were used to directly benefit students. And for larger schools, it would be necessary to spend 80% of the new funding to employ new staff and 20% on training and supplies. Prop 28 requires funding to be used for arts education programs and requires schools to certify that these funds were spent in addition to existing funding for art education programs. Each year, local governing boards would need to certify that the funding their schools received was spent on arts education. When we look at the costs, Prop 28 would increase state expenditures by about $1 billion per year for schools over and above the existing constitutional requirements. It would require the funding for arts and music education to be at least 1% of the funding received by schools in the prior year under Prop 98. Prop 28 supporters include artists and art organizations, education groups, labor groups, and wealthy individuals, some of which are listed on the slide. There is no organized committee formed in opposition. However, some newspaper editorial boards have recommended voters oppose the measure. The supporters say that uh, the arts and music education can improve a student's personal and ac academic life, but only one in five schools has a dedicated teacher for arts and music programs. And ultimately Prop 28 does not raise taxes. Um, opponents say, um, well, actually there are no opponents, but um, as mentioned, um, Several newspaper editorial boards recommended opposition on financial reasons. Uh, so far, uh, for financial uh, campaign finance, the teachers, groups, and wealthy individuals have raised $12 million in support of Prop 28. And as far as we know today, no groups have spent funds in opposition. So the bottom line for Prop 28 is that a yes vote means the state would provide additional funding specifically for arts education in public schools. And a no vote means that funding for arts education in public schools would continue to depend on state and local budget decisions. So thanks for listening to the update on Prop 28. Are there any questions? We, ha we have no questions, but we got one on a, a prior session. And that question is how can this not raise taxes if we're gonna spend more money on arts education? Yes, this, this um, measure doesn't raise taxes. It 
calls for a reallocation of the budget. So um, some other things wouldn't get funding and this would be prioritized. Thank you, we, we have no questions. Great, well, I'll hand it over to Elaine. Great, thank you, Nancy. All right, so now we're going to talk about Proposition 29. There, by the way, there are seven propositions from California, so we have three to go. <laughs> so Prop 29 requires on-site licensed medical professional at kidney dialysis clinics and reestablishes other state requirements. And the question is, should outpatient dialysis clinics be required to have a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant on site at all hours when patients are being treated? And should they be required to provide various clinic related information to patients and to the state? About 80,000 Californians receive hemodialysis every month in one of 650 dialysis centers. This treatment, which cleanses the blood of waste products, is usually done three times a week and each treatment lasts for four hours. Nearly three quarters of these clinics are owned by two for-profit corporations, Davida Inc. and Fresenius Medical Care. The California Department of Public Health is responsible for licensing them, and they use the federal regulations, including accepting Medicare and Medi-Cal payments. Now, currently, a board-certified medical doctor has to be affiliated with each chronic dialysis center and be responsible for the quality of care, the staff training, and the clinic practices. The federal law also requires reports on kidney-related infections. This is the third proposition that has been supported by SEIU on this topic. Now, here's some details about Prop 29. If it's passed, this proposition would require at least one licensed professional on site during the treatment at kidney dialysis clinics. And it also requires the clinic provide patients with a list of all physicians who have some ownership interest in the clinic of 5% or more, and they have to report that 5% plus ownership to the state every three months. If they fail to do so, they could be fined $100,000. It requires reporting of dialysis-related infections to a state agency. Right now, it's required for federal, the clinics would have to offer the same level of care to all patients, regardless of how it was paid. The fiscal impact is estimated to be in the low tens of millions of dollars to the state and the local government, as the state would have to pay for increased dialysis treatment costs for Medi-Cal patients, as well as the increased administrative responsibilities at the state level. Here's a list of the people in support and opposing. And what the supporters are saying is some say they need safer treatment through better supervision and regulation. And they don't want us to believe the scare tactics that will cause new costs or create a shortage of doctors. The opponents say it's been rejected twice. Stop this proposition. And it could take healthcare providers away from hospitals and emergency rooms. So the main financial supporters of this proposition is the Service Employees International Union. As of October 16th, the Voters Edge website where we get our information says 29,000 because money has come from previous times. The total donation has been 8.2 million for this election in support. The opponents, as you see, are uh, the two largest dialysis centers and some other clinics as well, and they have donated 86 million in opposition. So a yes vote means that the chronic dialysis clinics would be required to have a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant on site during all patient treatment hours, and a no vote means they would not be required to be on site. Are there any questions? Elaine, we don't have any questions, but I have a question, if I may ask. So this, as you mentioned, has come on the ballot. This will be the third time in three election cycles that we voted on it. And I have heard that this is fundamentally a, uh, a employer labor dispute. Is that a correct understanding? I have heard that as well. Um, and so, yes, there's something because they continue to bring it to to the voters. And so the voters can decide again how they wish to proceed on this. We, 
Uh, we've just gotten a question here. Um, so we've gotten two questions. It's the uh, first one is what are the issues that led the union to keep trying to bring this forward? Are employees being asked to do things they don't feel comfortable with? I don't have a tremendous amount of information on this. I do know that there has been some concern that sometimes something might not go right and you don't have a licensed person right there on site. And so that's caused some challenges. Uh, Tracy, do you have any additional information? I, I do, and I, maybe we can go back. Can we go back to the slide that shows who's supporting, not the funding, but the supporters? This one? Yes, in, in, in this one, you can see that the Nurses Association, Medical Association are opponents. And so what I have heard is this, this is not a groundswell from the medical side. Um, it, it is a, a subset of uh, the medical unions, a subset within that that are promoting it. And, and I have not heard that there have been um, uh, lawsuits or unusual uh, medical challenges uh, in California with the clinics not having this. But in just in reading about it, there's nothing that has flared up that said that there's a medical necessity that is being uh, needed to be met as a result of this. But haven't read that from the supporters, only from the opponents. There's there's another question, and I, I think we've just sort of touched on it. Is there evidence uh, that not having a physician on site has resulted in problems? And there again, the state of California regulations have not ever required that a physician be on site, that there are specialized medical professionals that deal in the in kidney dialysis work that are on site, but they're not. Uh, MDs, medical doctors. And I would say we also, we don't personally know of any cases that have occurred, um, but it doesn't mean they haven't occurred. We just are not aware of them. So it, I would suggest the person asking the question, definitely research um, because there probably is information available to answer that question. We just don't have happen to have it in this moment. So more research available, and we'll give you some resources as well at the end of the presentation where you can find more fact-checked information. Great questions, thank you. So with that, I'll, there are no, oh, let's see. Uh, nope, we've got all the questions. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. All right, so let's go on to Proposition 30. So this provides funding for programs to reduce air pollution and prevent wildfires by increasing the tax on personal income over $2 million. And it's an initiative statute and requires a majority vote to pass. So the question is, should the tax rate on personal income above $2 million be increased by 1.75% and the revenue dedicated to zero emission vehicle subsidies, zero emission vehicle infrastructure, such as electric vehicle charging stations and wildfire suppression and prevention programs. So wildfire smoke and gas powered cars are considered to be two of the largest sources of California greenhouse emissions, GHG, which contribute to climate change. And the state law requires California to reduce its GHG emissions level to 40% below the 1990 levels by the year 2030. The state law also requires the ride-sharing companies such as Lyft and Uber that they have 90% of their drivers using zero emission vehicles or ZEVs by the year 2030. The governor recently announced a plan that 100% of new vehicles sold must be ZEVs by the year 2035. Zero emission vehicles are considered unaffordable for many residents and the state lacks sufficient charging stations uh, to support that increased use of ZEVs and the drought is causing fire to become an increasingly catastrophic situation. So the state recently committed to spending $10 billion over the next five years on ZEVs and on average it spends two to four billion dollars annually on wildfire response. So Prop 30 proposes to raise the tax revenue to provide additional funding to help California achieve its greenhouse emissions reduction goals. And the tax rate would be increased by 1.75% on those making more than the $2 million per year, resulting in a top tax rate of 15.05%, which would be the highest in the nation. 
The tax increase would end in 2043 or earlier if emissions are 80% below the 1990 levels for three consecutive years. The expected revenue from Prop 30's tax increase is between three and a half to $5 billion each year, and they would be allocated 45% to support the ZEVs, 35% to increase the number of electric charging stations, and 20% to help fund the wildfire suppression and prevention. Here's the list of those in support and against. Uh, support includes Lyft, California Democratic Party, California State Firefighters, and others. The opponents include Howard Jarvis, Teachers Association, Republican Party, and, and Governor Newsom. But the supporters are saying that existing programs are insufficient to address California's poor air quality, largely caused by automobile and wildfire smoke. They also say that Prop 30 would make electric vehicles more affordable to lower income and disadvantaged communities. The opponents say that California is already spending more than $50 billion for a multi-year climate investment, including $10 billion for ZEVs. So the opponents say that it's heavily supported by Lyft as an attempt to get taxpayers to pay for increasing their number of ZEVs. The main financial supporters of this proposition at the time of this writing is Lyft, International Brotherhood of Electric Workers, and several others. And the total amount that they've donated is $47 million. Those opposed are the California Teachers Association and several uh, individuals, and they have raised $21 million. So bottom line, a yes vote means taxpayers would pay an additional 1.75% on personal income above $2 million annually. And the revenue collected from this tax would provide additional funds for zero emission vehicle programs and wildfire response and prevention activities. A no vote would mean a no change to the taxes on personal income above 2 million and funds being directed to these programs. It takes a majority a vote to pass. Does anyone have any questions? We have no questions at the moment. All right. I'm just giving it a second here. We'll move on. All right, Proposition 31. This is the last proposition. And this is a referendum on a 2020 law that would prohibit the retail sale of certain flavored tobacco products. And so the question is, should the law that was enacted by the California legislature to ban the sale of certain flavored tobacco products be approved? Now in 20, sorry, in 2009, a federal law banned flavor cigarettes except for menthol. In August of 2020, our California legislature passed SB 793, banning the sale of most flavored tobacco products, but it was put on hold because the referendum qualified for the 2022 ballot. A referendum asked that a law that's already been passed by the legislature and signed by the governor be approved by the voters, and it's put on the ballot if enough signatures are gathered. So the law at issue cannot be enforced until the election is held. So if Prop 31 passes, then those sales would stop and uh, SB 793 would become law. So the bill passed, as I say, the bill passed in 2020. It bans the retail and vending machine sales of all flavored tobacco products, such as e-cigarettes, cigars, et cetera. And you're being asked to vote on whether SB 793 should indeed become law or not. The fiscal impact of Prop 31 would most likely reduce state tobacco tax revenue, could be by up to $100 million a year due to less taxes that the state collects from those sales. But really the size of this revenue loss would depend upon whether smokers would switch from flavored to non-flavored tobacco products or just not buy them at all. Those in support include California Teachers Association and Governor Newsom and others. Those opposed are uh, the two large tobacco companies, Philip Morris and RJ Reynolds and others listed below. The supporters say it will help decrease smoking rates, especially among youth, and it could reduce the lifelong addiction that can come with nicotine. 
The opponents say it prohibits tobacco sales to adults and it will drive more tobacco sales into the underground market. The main financial supporters at the time of this uh, writing was, or the presentation, was 37 million total with the majority of it from Michael Bloomberg. And the opponents have raised $2 million. I think this is a typo. This is showing $2 million, but uh, I have other notes. So we'll have to check that at Voters Edge. But the um, most of the money has been raised by the tobacco companies. Tracy, do you have a chance of checking what uh, Voters Edge is saying on the I don't, but I we do have another question, and and um, maybe while I do my wrap up, we can come back and ask some questions. But Great. yes, thank you, thank you. All right, good. And so then the bottom line, the bottom line is uh, SB ninety three. Yes vote means an S SB ninety seven ninety three goes into effect, and it prohibits the retail and vending machine sale of flavored tobacco products and electronic nicotine delivery systems and a $250 penalty will be charged for each violation. A no vote means 793 would not go into effect and in-person stores and vending machine uh, sales of tobacco would continue to sell these flavored tobacco products as allowed under federal, state, and local rules. Requires a majority vote to pass. All right, so I understand there are questions, so let's see what the questions are. We actually have a question that came in late for Prop 30. So I'm gonna rewind you a little and then we'll see if anything comes in for 31. Right. Uh, the question on Prop 30 was, uh, many people already are moving out of California. I think the implication here is because of the tax rate. Would this not lead to even more high earners leaving? I think that is a possibility. We do hear in the news that um, high earners have left our state because our taxes are so high. You can move to Nevada, Nevada and other states and drop your, your state income tax pretty significantly. Um, the opponents would say, we have a quality of life in California that's hard to beat and not everybody would move out because of the tax increase of 1.75%. Yeah. So Elaine, just uh, making a call on the fly here. I'm, I am going to suggest that I'll almost wrap up and then we'll wrap back and see, actually, maybe we could take bounce to Nancy and see if she's got any responses for the question, two questions that came up. Nancy, were you able to look into those? Yeah, I was. I've been um, writing some answers in the um, closed section, the answered section, but essentially re regarding the question about um, the impact of legalization for the 30 states. Um, I'll just say that the 30 states, it's 35 now, and it's it's closer to basically what, what Prop 26 would do to legalize more dice games and in you know sports betting. Um, and then the online betting, um, it's still more restricted. Like for instance, um, you can't play as many casino games uh, per se. So Illinois is looking at making more online betting legalized. And I think there's um, fewer than 10 that have some sort of sports betting at the moment. But um, Illinois is, they do have, I'm just gonna state that they do have dollar signs in their eyes because it is bringing in more funding. Um, and in terms of the impacts, um, you'll find two camps if you Google it uh, or research it online. And basically, there are people who are um, proponents of the added funds to the state coffers. And those tend to be um, politicians and uh, journalists who like to report on it, and also the sports betting um, entities that um, you know, get the publicity from the betting activities, you know, like basketball, which is big in Illinois. So uh, the, one of the two camps, it must be said, are people who benefit by the gambling itself. And then on the other camp, the people that are more reserved and concerned about the increase in addiction problems and, um, and uh, social ills that might arise, and those tend to be social science researchers or people at universities that need to go through vetted studies, which take longer. So studies are just now starting to come out about um, 
the deleterious effects of the gambling that is actually much more addictive than in-person gambling. So um, I'll just state that, um, that, you know, there's basically those two sides and the side that, that does look at the social concerns does take a bit longer to get research and to um, present that. Thank you. And Elaine, I was able to check on Voters Edge and those opponents, uh, you had it right, it's, it ticked up a little bit today, but it's uh, 2.1 million in opposition. Great, thank you for the clarification. Sure, and we, and we did, and Nancy, thank you very much. We did have two more questions come in. Um, uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry, please go on, sorry. There was another question about how much money would really go to homelessness yes, thank you. to address homelessness. And the numbers in the proposition are that up that 85% of the 10% tax on gross online gambling um, uh, funds would go to, to homelessness. And the, even, even given the influx of cash, a lot of homeless, um, a lot of groups that um, provide services to homeless persons are neutral to the, um, to the proposition. And I think that the feeling is basically that it's complicated and it seems um, maybe a bit disingenuous to get money for homeless programs from people who are maybe going to wind up in the homeless programs because that they've gambled so much. So I think it's kind of like on moral grounds that people are relaxed are you know, maybe looking a little bit askance at supporting it. Um, so in general, a lot of homeless folks are neutral, even though it would be 85% of the 10% of the gross uh, proceeds from online gambling. Thank you very much. There was one quick question, Elaine, that I'll just handle here. Uh, uh, one of our participants asked if we're going to discuss local measures. And the, the, I have a very clear answer on that. There are no local measures in Cupertino and Sunnyvale, and, uh, nor in the county. And so we are not covering uh, local measures. Uh, there could be in other cities, but not in this one, uh, not in R2. And another one came in on Prop. 30, it says, if 30 passes, could 30 and other proposals uh, both be in effect? And other proposals. And so I'm not 100% certain on the question itself, but if Prop 30 passes and there are other measures like the governor's measure, the, the legislature passes things, they could all be a, in effect. But I don't know if that is actually answering the question the person is trying to ask. So yeah, I, I read it as, and, and if the individual liked to put in a clarifying question, we can cover it. But I read it as, just as you've interpreted it, there are many proposals around controlling greenhouse gases. Um, this is simply attacking one particular slice of it, and it would uh, run in tandem with the recent laws that Governor Newsom signed into law. It was. It is not in conflict. Let me just see. Uh, and we have not gotten a point of clarification on that. So I'll just give it another beat, and then we'll move on to our close. Okay. Okay. Well, we don't have any other questions, so we're going to wrap it up a little bit early here. And if we could, thank you, Elaine. Um, so we are at the end of the seven proposals, uh, but we can't close this without unabashedly soliciting um, that those of you that are not currently members of the League of Women Voters of Cupertino Sunnyvale to please join. And if you're not within our city confines of Cupertino or Sunnyvale, please join the, the uh, league nearest to where you live. This is a screen capture of our website and that red arrow on the upper right is pointing towards the join us button. Just click on that and, and it's a very easy process to join the League of Women Voters. And we need all of you. If you're attending today, I know that you are smart, engaged individuals and that's who we need to help join the League and really make democracy work. Next slide, please. So if you leave with nothing else, please vote. Please vote on, but preferably before November 8th. And as it says, democracy, you must be present to win. This is not a spectator sport. And with that, 
we're going to say thank you very, very much for attending today. Oh, I'm sorry, we have one more slide. Here's the, uh, Elaine mentioned this earlier. You, this is something for which you might want to do a quick screen capture. These are the resources that we use when we put together the analysis that we provided for you today. Um, so please take this. It, it is our go-to nonpartisan resources for understanding the ballot propositions and trying to suss through the information. And now the last slide. That's a wrap on our side. We thank you so very much for attending and please do consider joining the League of Women Voters. Thank you.